You're listening to the 2019 Nelson Arts Festival, Page and Blackmore, Puka Puka Talks. This session features Chessie Henry and Miriam Lanswood in conversation with Kerry Sunderland. Well, kia ora koto. Welcome to the opening session of Page and Blackmore, Puka Puka, Puka, Puka Talks. Um, my name is Kerry Sunderland and I'm the coordinator of um, the program and I'm delighted to be joined on stage this morning by uh, Chessie and Miriam who I'll introduce in a moment. I just want to say a few um, things first. Uh, firstly, a big thank you to Joe Dippy and Sally who are over here at the official Page and Blackmore Puka Puka Talks bookstore. It's a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> um, and you will be able to get copies of both uh, Chessie and Miriam's books over there and they'll be signing them after the session, so over on this table here. Um, just if you haven't already, could you please turn off your microphones, or, uh, microphones, your, um, <laughs> microphones, your mobile phones um, or pop them on silent. And for the late arrivals, <clears throat> if you need the bathroom, they're just through the door over there. So here we are on the edge of, of the program, the very first session, and I'm joined by two authors who have both, in a way, written about what it's like living on the edge. But we may not all be aware, but we're all living on the edge, really, in the times we're living in at the moment, whether we're woke or not. But that's not necessarily what I was thinking when I came up with the title for this session, it landed in my consciousness from somewhere and then, then I read your book and I found that you mentioned On the Edge, Living on the Edge in your book and we had a conversation around it. So it went, oh, look, that, that seems to fit really well. And as I prepared for this session and reread um, Chessie's book again as well, I realised that it's a theme that is explored quite a lot in both books. So that's where we're going today. But first, a quick intro. Um, I, I think it's never been more important to question the way we live acknowledge we are part of and not separate to nature, and consider how we respond to natural disasters and other climate events at the moment. So if you're looking for inspiration, I, I don't think you can look much further than Miriam Lancewood, who has, with her partner Peter, decided to leave, well, for a long time, decided to leave the material world behind and learn how to live in the wilderness, and also spent quite a bit of time traversing the length of Aotearoa. Born in 1983, Miriam grew up in the Netherlands and was a competitive pole vaulter and studied PE before travelling Africa and India, where she met Peter. So everyone, please join me in welcoming Miriam Lansford. And Chessie Henry was born in 1992, so I'm really feeling like the old, much older person on the stage, I must say, and grew up in Christchurch and Kaikoura with a stint in Tokolo. Yeah. She is the eldest of five children and first studied creative writing at Massey University and went on to gain her Master of Arts in Creative Writing from Victoria University's International Institute of Modern Letters. And that's where we met because we were doing the MA at the same time. And the lovely Elizabeth Knox, who's in the audience, was our supervisor. We shared her. <laughs> So it was no surprise that Chessie turned to writing, I think I can say, safely say this, to make sense of the trauma and stress that impacted on her family after the big February earthquake in Christchurch and then the Kaikoura earthquake almost six years later. So please join me in welcoming Chessie Henry. Hey. And of course, um, very sticky, sticky note worthy books, both of them. Um, both uh, Women in the Wilderness and We Can Make a Life are Miriam and Chessie's debut books, their very first books. So we're going to look at that a little bit in a minute. But one of the things that I really noticed in reading this, um, both of them, is that family connections run really deep in these books. Um, and that might sound surprising a little bit with Miriam since she and Peter were spending so much time by themselves in the wilderness, but Miriam kept in contact with her family by letter writing. So what I want to do is ask both of you to just tell us a little bit about your families to get started. So, Miriam, would you like to go first? Yeah, I grew up in Holland, in a very sort of normal household, really. Um, but we did a lot of uh, music and drama. My mother is a drama therapist, so she always came home with these uh, exercises that she had made up, and then we had to um, sort of practice them with them. And... Um, 
uh, yeah, with the music and uh, theater. Um, I have two sisters, and uh, my parents seem to be still very happy together. <laughs> and uh, they have all moved out of Holland, though. Uh, my parents went to France, my sister went to France, and my other sister went to Sweden. Because Holland is very, very crowded and very flat. And uh, so I saw the opposite here in New Zealand with lots of mountains, which gives me actually a third dimension. To me, there is an, another dimension with all these mountains. So, um, yeah, that's in short <laughs> my background. Okay, great. Thank you. And, Tessie, your book is a family memoir, essentially. So could you tell us about your families before yeah, we launch into sure. more specific questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, kia ora, everyone, and thanks so much for coming. Um, yeah, my family, they're here, actually. I've got mum and dad. <laughs> Mum's rolling her eyes at me already. <laughs> um, and my brother Rufus is here, too. And I've got three other brothers who aren't here, but we're all... Um, yeah, my, my parents are from the UK and moved out here, I think, 28 years ago. And um, I was born here and grew up here with my brothers. Um, we're from Kaikota, so just down the road, really. Well, not actually, but four hours away. But, um, yeah, so that's us. Okay, great. Thank you both very much. Now I want to ask you to cast your minds back to before the, the days before you both started working on these books. And did you ever imagine that you would be writing a memoir at such a young age? I can say that because I'm the older one. <laughs> Miriam. Oh, um, so Peter and I have been living in the wilderness of New Zealand for six years. And once I found myself in a, in a friend's place and I had not much to do, and I wrote down one day of our life. And um, I sent that, that piece of work to um, uh, a magazine called Mind Food. And they took it. And... The publisher read this, and she, did, uh, she suggested writing a book. And so I thought, a book? I've only written two pages. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I thought, I can't write a book. But then my partner said, well, I, this is such an opportunity. You know, people write manuscripts and they send it to hundreds of publishers. You should at least have a go. <laughs> okay. So uh, I read a couple, of a couple of chapters and sent it off, and um, they were very happy with it. But um, it's not like I bought my whole life to book, so it's, you know, about six years. Um, yeah, I'm amazed that it went well, and um, I really enjoyed the writing process. It's such an adventure. Yeah. yeah, and in fact, um, Miriam just told me she's working on her second book, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, perhaps, yeah. So, Chessie, you were already a writer, so, but tell us the story of how this book came to, to begin. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think also, and to your earlier question about writing a memoir at a really young age, like, that was something I definitely was conscious of and felt a bit, like, wanky, you know, being like, yeah, I'm writing a memoir about my life. So it was never kind of about that. But I think I've always been drawn to writing about my um, sort of personal experiences and and have done a lot of li lots of little bits, but um, never something big. And then I think this book came uh, about after I'd completed my master's, so I just had this big year of, like, really immersive learning and just felt like I'd learnt so much. And then uh, while that was... And then it sort of there's a whole lot of stuff going on at home. Just um, my dad's a rural GP and there was kind of a bit of a sort of drama unfolding there. And then um, just the earthquakes um, in Kaikoura, which um, we were really affected by. And I think um, I sort of felt strongly that there was a story in there and it felt really doable because I just had had this practical experience. So it kind of was a bit of a perfect storm of being able to yeah, had, had the confidence to kind of get it all down, a lot of it, you know. Mm. So, and I yeah. believe you sort of felt a sense of urgency to write this story, yeah, though. Yeah, I definitely you? did. Yeah. I, I, could, I felt that it was, um, because it was kind of all so raw and happening then and there, and I, I kind of knew that in two years' time um, I'd have a totally different perspective on it and it would maybe lose that sense of sort of rawness that I think was what people, I feel that people connect with in it now. And it's totally true, you know, I look back at it now and I would read bits and be like whoa you know that's crazy that I felt like that then because with time you totally feel you know differently and so um it's it's very much a moment in time but it is um I'm glad I got that down there yeah I particularly like um how you define memoir on page 31 to be precise do you remember that definition <laughs> um Jesse writes a memoir is a story constructed from memories selected and sometimes invented 
moments imagined by me or someone else. I choose all the pieces that make it in, um, which I think was really interesting. And I, I, another quote that I really like. <laughs> this is great. No, yeah. Well, actually, this is from Helen, this is from Helen Garner. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is, um, Every time I write a book, I lose a husband. Um, so your books, both of your books, um, you know, you have your family members in it, your partner, your, 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 your siblings and your, your parents. How did you each go about negotiating consent from, from them to write about them? Um, did it happen before, during or after you started writing? Obviously, you just told us Peter encouraged you to, to write the book, so I guess that was yeah. his in- consent, was it? <laughs> yeah, sometimes yeah. he was reading the manuscripts. And, oh, I don't look very good if you want <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. And make it slightly different. <laughs> Um, yeah, for my family, um, I also send all the chapters to my sister, and uh, she came. Yeah, my favorite one, and uh, she came back with some good feedback. Um, so yeah, it's a very good uh, cooperation. Okay, yeah. So it was. It wasn't something you had to do formally. It was just kind of implied by the support oh. you got from the. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. And and how about you, Chrissy? Um Mine was yeah. I think my family. I feel, yeah, very lucky. They were very um, supportive of me initially. I sort of said, I sort of want to work on this project and can I interview you and can I talk to you about it? And I think they knew enough of my writing and knew me well enough, I hope, to feel that I would, you know, handle it sensitively and and be respectful of them. Um, And then I very much went away and wrote it and didn't show them at all because I didn't feel like during that process of figuring out what was going to go in and not, or, you know, it felt like I'd rather just give them something at the end and you know, we didn't sort of simplify the process. And so um, at the end, I was sort of like, you know, like, sorry, here it is. And my brothers were really surprised. I think they, they were like, oh, you know, you actually wrote it. Um, and, and so, yeah, so then I had to um, kind of, yeah, let, let them all read through it. I, we still, we, we joke that I don't think Dad's actually ever read it. He sort of like was like, oh. and now all the time is like, is that in there? Um, but yeah, they, luckily for me, um, didn't, we didn't change anything. Yeah. But yeah, it is true that sometimes you have to write something negative about a person and you don't want to, and they certainly shouldn't then read the story, but uh, you can't say all the time that everyone is friendly. God, all of us get a bit boring. So uh, <laughs> you have to have a you know, black sheep somewhere. Did you use um, aliases or pseudonyms for the other characters in your... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Mouse, time. is Mouse really called Mouse? Or no, no, of course not. <laughs> Does Mouse know he's Mouse? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cool. Um, you have to read more about mouse. So, um, Tessie, it was very clear from your book that you were, and you've said this already, that you were right in the middle of your story as you were writing it, and it was enfolding, unfolding around you. How did this affect how you wrote the book? Like, did you just sort of keep going, or did you go back and make changes um, again? Yeah, so I think an example that I've spoken about before um, was sort of um, while I was writing, we were kind of, we just lost our house in the Kaikoura earthquake and I kind of was thought, I should actually talk to Dad about the Christchurch earthquake because he was there at the time and um, over the, the day by chance. And um, so I interviewed him in the car and it was, uh, we sort of, we were driving from Christchurch to uh, Kaikoura to Christchurch. So we had sort of three hours to talk and um, I interviewed him and it was a really um, harrowing experience with both of us I think just kind of reliving this story that I had not really known about in great detail and um after that I think that really brought up a lot of stuff for dad that then and I you know I'm I'm poor dad he's like go here we go again (laughs) um but um yeah I think just that realizing that the stuff I was asking was bringing stuff up which was then affecting our home life and and I think afterwards dad really realized that was a very undealt with kind of um experience that he'd had and so that then changed the course of what was happening and so then I was sort of writing and and um uh, Fergus who published the book was here I feel sorry for him because when I arrived with the book it was this big mess of like I was like I don't know how to finish this because it's all happening now um and so we kind of just um let that be the case you know so it, it, it leaves it quite a um yeah, it's just a right moment in time. So mm. Well, it. yeah, I think that's one of the hardest things about writing memoir is knowing when it finish, finishes. When to stop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, was that difficult for you or did it just sort of feel like it because you're, you have several um, 
you venture out into the wilderness several times during your book, don't you? And there's sometimes when you return back and then you decided to do the Te Araroa Trail yeah. as well. Did that feel like a really logical place to end, end the story? Yeah, yeah. we uh, walked the Te Araroa Trail, which took us 10 months. Um, by the end, I was going to write the book. Okay. So Did you know that before you set out or was it sort of something that kind of um, happened during that walk? Sort of during that yeah. walk okay. that happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So my question too for you is um, that your book is very rich with sensory details and lots of dialogue. So I want to ask you, do you have the most incredible memory ever or were you writing along the way, keeping a journal or how, how, did, how did you sort of bring back all those <laughs> details? Yeah. yeah. So imagine we're living in the wilderness in a tent and, you know, we observe birds and you know, I learn a lot about goats where they live and what they like to eat and where they like to sleep. And they're actually very much like humans. They like to sit on, an, on a little outcrop and look out, nice view and all that. Anyway, we learn a lot about that. And then a human turns up, a hunter, and that's such an event, I absorb it with every inch. Okay. And so afterwards, we have something to talk about. And we talk endlessly. Remember, he said this and said that. So that's ah, why okay. that is such a big event that uh, it was quite easy to memorise years, years later. Also, I wrote, I've written letters to my favourite sister. And then it's a, a hunter turned up and he was like this and he told us this. And they're very um, honest, amazingly so. They're away from their wife and family and they... they open up. Anyway, <laughs> all sorts of secrets come out. So it's very exciting. And that's why I remember it, because uh, not that much happens, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So, so the conversations you have with each other or with other people who turn up, uh, like watching a, mo a motion picture and you know you've got that yeah. imprint on your brain. For that. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to go dive into your story a little bit now, Miriam. And my question is, because I couldn't believe it, is why decide to go bush in winter, the most challenging season of all? That was... <laughs> I mean, I would have, I, when I moved to New Zealand, I made um, my husband, David, who's down here, wait. To, we had to go to Nepal and India and everywhere until it got warm enough for me to move here. So <laughs> <laughs> It was just because I was working for a year in Blenheim to get my residency. So after the year was finished, then we could go. But also we weren't too afraid because we were reading all these books about expeditions going to the South Pole and people living in the South Pole, North Pole and Amundsen with his dogs and eating his dogs. And what we were going to do wasn't that radical. We were just going to, you know, an hour's drive from Blenheim and um, live in the mountains, 1,200 metres, you know, it wasn't Everest. And uh, yeah, that's why we <laughs> started in, in, in late autumn, yeah. And so fairly early on in the, in the book, you say it felt exhilarating to be free of possessions. Can you talk a little bit more about that? How, what was that? What was exhilarating about letting go of everything and leaving, selling all your belongings and, and leaving everything behind? Um, yeah, so we moved into the mountains. As a start, so we thought it would only be four seasons. So that was sort of, we couldn't think, we never thought it was going to be uh, seven years in New Zealand. Um, but so we have to give away all our our belongings, just give it to the op shop and that. But I felt that the more I gave away, the more sort of space I had in my mind, as though those possessions take up space in your head. And because you have to, if you think about it, if you have a car, you have to look after it, you have to pay for it, to um, you know maintain it and all that. And therefore, you have to work for it. So it, it all becomes something. And the more you get rid of it, the better. Yeah. Okay, I'll take your word for that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm moving house at the moment. I need to downsize. Um, so going from being a lifetime vegetarian to a hunter who eats offal is probably your most overt or obvious transformation. But how else did living in the wild change you? I know that's a big question, but maybe just pick up a couple of places. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so I grew up vegetarian. My mother never cooked meat. And then we had the idea of living in the wilderness. And I had seen this guy with his bow and arrow. And I thought, oh, I want to do that too. Robin Hood was, used to be my hero as a kid, you know. Um, and uh, I thought, if you're going to live in the wilderness, then I will be hunting. And obviously then you have to eat meat. But I thought that was ethically quite a good thing to do, seeing the ecological problems here with introduced animals. So um, that's why I sort of um, turned the switch on. 
But it was nevertheless very strange to find a possum in a trap that you then have to grab, you know, the animal's alive, you have to grab at the tail and then um, bash his head in. <laughs> so um, that's very traumatic. And in fact, I filmed completely and um, I started crying and, you know, everything went wrong. It was terrible. Um, but we were so cold in that first winter that we needed the energy to keep warm during the night because we woke up with hunger pains and um, especially Peter was losing weight <laughs> and uh, went really quite bad. So when we ate the first possum, uh, it was the first time we didn't wake up with hunger pains and we needed that energy. So that's why I kept on going. Uh, another big change in my life was to go from quite a busy life with technology and time and planning and diaries and, you know, things to do in the future, to having no time and no future. That is the biggest surprise I had that I didn't expect. Um, we arrived there, first day was fantastic, and then the second day was, oh, there's not that much to do here. <laughs> And then the third day, I thought, oh, <laughs> what am I going to do? There's nothing to do. I'm going to be so bored. And um, then Peter said, because he's got some experience, he's 30 years older than I am, and he said, you have to calm down. There is nothing to do here. You have to learn the art of doing nothing. And then I discovered, you know, how I'm almost afraid of this. I'm almost afraid of uh, boredom and nothingness. Well, how can you be afraid of nothing? So these are the questions we had to deal with and solve it, which you can over time. Yeah. Again, relatively early in the book, I think it was about after two months, you wrote, I didn't miss anything from the world I left behind. Um, nothing, really? <laughs> was there anything that you missed? No, no, that world out in the mountains with the, the rivers and the forest, everything that's living, everything living, 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 there is no, no place to miss anything. No, it's amazing. What about some types of food, though? Did you miss any of that? No, it's a bit like um, if you buy a packet of lollies, yeah. you sort of eat it, and when it's not there, you don't think of it, yeah. right? And uh, there was no way we'd, we could get that certain food. Or we never talked about it. And it might have been torture to actually think about it anyway, perhaps. <laughs> well, we were quite, quite, quite well fed <laughs> and you know, quite happy. So. <laughs> Not really. Okay. Um, so we've mentioned already that you wrote um, letters to your family. Um, I'm really curious, though, you wrote about the letters you sent and you include the text of some of them in the book, which I really enjoyed those parts. Um, but what about the ones you received back? Did, could you get letters back? Posted to what? <laughs> Meet some family? Yeah. Well, no, you post restante, you know, when you go out to busk and you... Because you did go back uh, to yeah, town sometimes occasionally. Sometimes we had to yeah. do uh, resupply and yeah. then I go to the library because I had to find a computer... It's very difficult to find these days because we had no machines of any, of any kind, not even a watch. So I go to get uh, groceries uh, for the food supplies and I go to the library to find a computer and then I find an email. She just wrote an email. And, and do you get emails back from your family during those yeah. times? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just around emails. Yeah. So Did no she write letters. letters back and just didn't post them or was it just sort of a one-way correspondence? Yeah, no, she just wrote back on the emails okay. and replying yeah. Um, yeah. from the letters. Yeah. yeah. But it's really funny, I wrote the letters and just keep on writing, writing, writing until we saw a hunter. So sometimes it's like 10 or 12 pages. And then my parents would receive the letter and they smell it and it smelled of smoke. Oh. It was <laughs> everything smelled of smoke, my hair, everything. Which you wouldn't have noticed after a while, no, I'm sure. No, yeah, not at all. Yeah. Um, you write in the book that your aloneness in nature actually made you feel more connected to other people. Can you tell us more about this? I think the less you see people, the more you appreciate them. <laughs> the other extreme, like in Holland, people just want to have space and they get quite grumpy on the street. But uh, maybe uh, most of the people here would have walked in, in the forest and then if you finally see someone you don't expect, you make a little chit-chat. And uh, because it's very special to see another human. Yeah, so living out there, we really appreciate it. didn't matter mm. if it was, you know like-minded or anything like that. It was just fantastic to see somebody. Yeah. 
And you've told us that your relationship with time changed completely and it became very much about the present moment. And actually, when reading that is probably the bit I felt most envious about. I was like, my life is so busy. Um, do you think it's possible for us to shift our relationship with time back here in the kind of unreal world? Or is it only something that you've found that you've been able to achieve when you've been out in the wilderness? Has, um, it, has your relationship with time changed now? You're back at the moment living in, um, in a, not urban, but a, you know environment yeah. with a lot more people. <laughs> yeah, I can see how machines and technology speed up time. It's amazing how the computer eats your time up. You know, it's really four hours gone, you know, it's amazing. Um, but I think if I have to give any sort of advice, that um, don't be afraid of the boredom because you need through the, to go through a stage of boredom in order to come to a peaceful state of mind. Mm. So the mind goes a little bit mm, to mayhem, and then the peace comes. But we often don't quite get there, right? Mm, mm. And how important is that kind of boredom and that space for your creative process um, in, the, in terms of writing the book? Do you find it challenging now that you're back in, um, <coughs> in civilization, for want of a better term, to... To write, or well, you did most of the writing for the first book in Civilization too, didn't you? Rather than out in the wilderness. Yeah, yeah. We, we found a little cottage way out in the countryside in a farm where I wrote a the first book, um, and now we are for the first time in a house with electricity, and um, that is really very um, has a lot of effect in terms of sleeping also because the light keeps you awake, and I think in order to be creative you have to sleep a lot and be very well rested, and be in nature to get that um, the feeling of creativity, you mm. might. Yeah, well, different. actually, I have exactly the same question for Chessie. Yeah. <laughs> about, and I know that you're busy working too at the moment, so that how, with time and space to, for creative process, do you want to talk yeah, a bit about I that? Yeah, I think for me, um, I definitely, time and space would be the key words in terms of for my creative process, I feel like those are essentials. <laughs> Just being able to have time and space to work on work on things. And I've been trying to do that a little bit around my job, um, but finding that really hard. But I also don't want to, um, you know, I feel like, it must be, it's possible, <laughs> you know, maybe it's just a practice thing, so I'm not trying to shut that idea off either. Um, but yeah, I think for me so far, um, absolutely having the time and space to, to work on my book was what allowed me to do it. Yeah. So you, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Because that was an, quite an unusual path to publication. Yeah. You ran a yeah. Boosted campaign, yeah. Yeah, I ran a Boosted campaign. So Boosted is a, um, a sort of crowdfunding platform that um, is managed by the Arts Foundation. And um, so you kind of present your creative project and apply and then they um, accept it or, or whatever and, um, and then you basically have 30 days to reach a target amount um, and then if you don't reach the target then all the money goes back to people that have donated but if you reach the target you can keep the money um, and it was um, for me that was I just wanted to drop down to part time hours so that I could pay my rent and um, write and it was a bit of a, like, you know, it's not very nice asking for money, I think. It was a bit of a, um, had to get my head around it. But once I did it, I think it's actually been one of the most sort of special parts of writing this book because I think so many people felt really invested, like literally invested from the beginning. And I sort of said, I've got this idea and I want to write it. And a lot of my kind of friends and family and random people said, yep, go do it, go forth. And, um, and donated to the to the campaign and then um, I did that and dropped down to part time and so I spent a lot of time um, just writing and that was really cool and then I think being able to I kept in touch with the people who donated and said like it's coming <laughs> and then when it got published it was really exciting and then um, they've still could have sort of remained part of the journey yeah so that was but that was really essential for me and yeah now I'm working I'm struggling to write <laughs> haven't quite figured out how to do it I know the feeling um, so Again, um, family letters has, have been a part of your book too. So, um, and I, when I was reading, you know, the chapters you opened with the beginning of your family before you even existed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, obviously you relied on those letters, um, and also you had your parents' photo albums and your mum's diaries. Um, but what other research did you have to do to paint such vivid images of life before you were born? 
Um, that was a funny... I mean, that I, I sort of started... Right, it was really... I sort of didn't know where to start and I ended up um, going back quite a lot further to... Um, there was... My parents are born on the same day of the same year, so it kind of was this funny little starting point <laughs> where they both arrived into the world and I was like, perfect, I'll start there. Um, and... Um, and then, yeah, there was a lot of, a lot of, yeah, just trying to write. And a, we've, I, I talk a lot with my parents. So I feel like some of those stories are really vivid in my mind. And that was almost a issue as they, as it, as I wrote, because I found myself writing like my ten-year-old self, you know, being like, and then mum and dad did this, and it was sort of like, okay, you need to kind of make this not so um, <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> I don't know, but um, but it was, it was actually really, it was a, it was a great experience doing that because. Um, I actually ended up, a lot of people just started dropping things off to me, like sort of coming in with boxes of old photos or my parents' friends being like, oh, if you're writing about this, you've got to write about this. Um, and my my um, my granny, who I'm quite close with, she sent me a lot of stuff, a lot of old letters. She'd saved all the emails my parents had ever sent her from various places around the world. And it was, it was a kind of, yeah, it was a really sweet um, experience for me writing that part. But a lot of it, I suspect, is, is made up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so there's another example that I'll ask you about now. So you hint at your um, dad's um, mental well-being early on in the book when describing how happy he was in Africa. I think you're right. A feeling that carries a lot of weight for someone like him who finds happiness so evasive, slipping like water through his hands. What have you learned about resilience from your dad and what have you learned about happiness from him? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> poor dad. Hey, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I th- <laughs> Tell them later. I think um, from both my parents, um, it's, I don't know, I, I, the word resilience is so hard because it's not always about being resilient and sometimes you just don't feel resilient and you feel vulnerable. And I think um, we've kind of all been on this together, so I feel like we've learned from each other a lot. And in writing this book, kind of figured stuff out about all ourselves. I don't know, but I suppose... Um, essentially what I feel about trauma of any kind I guess is that often it's you feel this loss of um, belief in the goodness of the world or you feel um, you know you end up feeling like things are kind of going to go wrong or you've you know you've lost your home and and you sort of lose a sense of safety or you just sort of lose all these things and and then um, I think the idea of like self-care and kind of it being the solo pursuit of getting better you know, it's sort of a, a really tricky situation we put ourselves in by putting the onus on yourself to kind of get yourself through it when really you need reassurance that those things are still there, you know? And I think that's a totally community effort, really, or you need people to confirm that with you, that be like, it's okay, we're still having this good time, our home is still, you know, we can still make home somewhere else, or we can, you know, still have happy moments and amongst all of this and that's that kind of you just you can't do that on your own because yeah it's you don't it's lost (laughs) so I think there was a big um so home was where your family was not necessarily yeah and just and just having that reassure you need people to reassure you that those things are still there I think that's healing you know and so then trying to do it on your own um in my experience doesn't work and I think um that was something we've all learnt, to, you know, as through this whole period. What did you learn about attachment to physical spaces when, when you lost your family home? Yeah, it's or funny. I mean... Access to it, I should say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, we always place so much value on our home because, it, you know, it was this really special place to all of us and it was, it was to do with land and... And, but it felt really that this irreplaceable thing and, um, and then within it, irreplaceable objects where you've, you know, this is this meaningful thing that someone's given me that has all this weight and um and in the book I think that's very prevalent you know and 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 I was grieving while I wrote that um but it's funny now because you just have this capacity to just like start again and place that emotion onto other things and so it's kind of been a funny experience of rebuilding now rebuilding our home and um finding that we're all actually totally fine you know and and we're like oh the you know it's 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 not the same it's a different place but it actually still now feels meaningful and and ours and yeah it's I think again still feel sort of navigating that yeah how, how much I think they um I was really fascinated with your chapter about living in Tokolo and 
So do you want to just tell us about how your family home changed when you were in Tokelau and what happened when you came back to, to um, yeah. New Zealand afterwards? Yeah, yeah. that was... Um, to- I'm, I say Tokelau, but oh, I'm not, yeah, I don't know. You're probably to- right, because no, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm sure an Australian I'm and I'm pronouncing <laughs> it <laughs> This is Go how, with you, anyway, you're the well, we don't, anyway, Tokelau, Tokelau. Tokelau. Uh, yeah. There's a little Pacific Island, um, kind of three days by boat from Samoa, and um, Dad, as a GP, um, sort of, we went out there to work as a doctor, um, so six months to a year on this um, sort of tiny little Pacific Island, which is, I think there was 500 people, and it was very... Um, pretty out there and we arrived as a sort of family five kids under ten um, parlangi <laughs> you know not knowing much and so we um, yeah it was a really uh, and it was funny because when I was writing the book I ended up writing about that and uh, not I was amazed at how vividly it came back and how important it felt and it was kind of funny because I don't think I fully had appreciated how much of an impact it had on, my, on our lives but um, yeah, it was a very much a, a sort of we all slept on the floor in, in, a, in one room. And, and I think when we got back, we had a little bit of sort of reverse culture shock where it felt really all these having your own room felt this really isolating kind of um, big, yeah, just we all felt very sort of separated. And we ended up, um, that's we I'd grown up in Sumner in Christchurch, and that's when we moved to Kaikoura and my parents bought a two bedroom house for the seven of us because I think that's just what felt normal at the time. Um, and yeah, so that really it did had a big effect, and I think that's the closeness of um, my brothers and I actually stems a lot from there. Mm. Mm. What about your sense of home? How do you? Def- where's home for you, Miriam? Yeah, I was just thinking your question, um, the, the attachment to a physical place, and I thought by myself I am more attached to not having one, and am very attached to being nomadic. The thought of living in one place for the rest of my life um, feels a little bit like choking. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I also think, I think, um, because what I've observed is the first year, the first four seasons, it's really nice. And after some time, you don't see the beauty so much anymore. You um, sort of get used to it. And the view, the view is really nice, the river is really nice, but you know, it wasn't like that first, the first few months. And I guess my partner, Peter, and I are always looking for the, the new thing. And we justify that feeling with saying that our ancestors, we nomads, and, you know, we all come out of Africa and, you know, always looking for the new and the unknown. In any way, we feel that way. Um, yeah, always. So is uh, it that sense of things. feeling almost more alive when you're in an unfamiliar environment? Yeah, you yeah. see it as new and it's also exciting. But, of course, the downside is that it can also become an addiction. They're always moving. Uh, it's good to find a middle way. But, um, yeah, I'm very happy, always very happy and very enthusiastic when I can roll up the tent and put everything in a pack and then we go off again. Yeah, that's a fantastic feeling. How long since you did that? Yeah. Um, How much time? I have... Um, so this is a little bit about the second book, which I'm not going to tell too much about. But Peter and I ended up in Turkey. And we started uh, walking this um, trail called the Nikia, Nikia Way. And in the end, Peter said, right, I hate my... And he didn't say it. He looked at his pack and was really like, oh, God. And I could see at that moment he hated his pack. And he didn't need to say it. And I, I knew then that he's just finished with carrying a pack. And at the same day, we talked about it, and I said, I don't realize, you know, I had enough. And the same day, I thought, I haven't. <laughs> so I said to Peter, I always want to, do, um, to take part of an expedition, a real expedition. But how do I going to find such a thing? And then Peter said, well, why don't you organize your own? So I did. And uh, to be different, I thought I organized this female expedition to go with more other women go hunting and really living off the land. So we, after a lot of adventures, came back in New Zealand and organized this, what I called the epic female expedition. It's all in the name. And uh, I only found one other person. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long story. About 200 people applied, but only one was, was good enough. <laughs> was, the thing was that uh, I can only hunt for one other person, and none of the 200 people could really hunt. 
So uh, I could hunt for two people, so we went with the two of us. Anyway, uh, we went from Atus Pass towards Wanaka, over eight mountain ranges, without a trail this time, without um, any supplies, and we had <laughs> rods and rifles, and uh, we survived, obviously. <laughs> yeah. So you need to train some more women hunters to expand the, yeah. the party. Yeah, then we're good get, so to yeah. come back to your question, that finished in March. And then I started writing my second book. Yeah. So um, just going back to your point about we were all nomadic once upon a time, um, there's a lot more people on the planet now. And I found it really fascinating um, in your chapter where you were doing the Te Araroa Trail and you were warned not to go somewhere because there were so many hunters that you might get shot. <laughs> so if everyone decides to take a leaf out of Miriam's book and go and live in the wilderness, it could become quite problematic, couldn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll stay. Just stay in the city. <laughs> yeah. um, but... Um, We'll come back to that in a minute because I want to ask you about, you know, what, what you hope people will come from it. But I just wanted to, to jump to um, life after your book. Um, and I want you to tell us about the impact your book has had on a little bit about how it it's, might have changed the thinking around both the rural health system and supporting rural GPs, whether it has or not, and also in encouraging men to talk about mental health. Sure. Um, I think because so... Dad being a rural GP, I don't know if people might not have read the book, but it's um, it's a really unique job and that it requires you to sort of be be up for dealing with anything, um, you know, like car accident, um, domestic violence, someone giving birth, um, any kind of issue that sort of comes in the door. You're and it's a small community, so you often you know the people, and it's just basically very emotionally charged. And as a family member, I was sort of watching that unfold, feeling very um, helpless and just watching this sort of, I mean, I think Dad described it as a bit of a, a, a car crash, you know, and um, and I think, so a lot of that writing in this book was born out of a real frustration of watching that happen and feeling like there was, you know, we tried, Mum and I tried to turn to various people to say, like, don't really think this is safe or don't really feel like this is um, fair <laughs> or we feel worried and it was really, yeah, there just didn't really seem to be a solution anywhere and, um, and we... Um, I mean, I think that's still the case. I don't think it's changed anything, unfortunately. I mean, I think it's um, anecdotally, maybe. You know, I've had a lot of people say, wow, we didn't know that, and that, you know, I didn't, never really thought about it that way. Or um, and I think people have been really supportive, and especially in the Kaikoura community, I think. Would you think, is that fair? Yeah. Um, and just, um, I think, you know, I think people are aware it's an issue, which is good. But I don't know if there's anything really changing at the moment, to be, to be honest. Um, uh, but it's, it's complicated, so you know it needs to kind of go back to the way we train doctors and how we make rural medicine more appealing. And there's lots, lots of it's a big kind of complicated issue. But I think having, you know, I think that's why just having a personal story um, is just a good. I felt that was a good addition for, that I could make to the conversation. Um, and the second part of your question it was about men talking about. Mental oh health. yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's 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 changing a lot. I mean, I think, you know, all of us are getting better at having these conversations about mental health. I think that's like, you know, it's a bit of a, we're all, yeah, it's, people are talking about it. I think that still there's a bit of a, you know, and I've talked with uh, Dad a lot about this, about the, you know, kind of knowing that it's good to talk about something and then actually doing it. I think there's still a bit of a disconnect there and then how do, how do we become better at responding and as, you know, supporters, how do we get better? And, and I think we're still, yeah... But I think it's, um, you know, I've had a lot, of, a lot of handwritten letters from this book from people saying this really, you know, I connected with this. And, and I think um, it's been, yeah, really, really amazing for me to have that kind of come out of it. Um, have you had fan mail too, Miriam? Yeah, fan mail. <laughs> have you had some fan mail too? Fan letters, mail? Letters from readers. Yeah, emails. Yeah, every yeah day. emails, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you move around, it's probably hard to post you a... Later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you each... Um, I've got a tricky question for you now. Can you tell me about something that you chose to leave out of your book? Oh. <laughs> and why? <laughs> and you think about it too. You're hinting on something? No, no, no. Yeah, no. I'm, I'm, hope, I'm hoping there's more than one answer so I don't, haven't put you on the spot completely. Um, no, I'll try to be very honest and put everything in. Okay. Yeah. Because I think that honesty makes a good book. Yeah. Otherwise it becomes boring. 
And, um, yeah, but you, you might have left it some boring bits out. No? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I left the boring bits out. Uh, yeah, and a little bit of controversial stuff about 1080, the editor actually took out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, gosh, you probably opened the can of worms for question time now. Okay. <laughs> Was there anything that you left, you decided, um, no, I'm not going to put that in this book? That um, had, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that was something I grappled with a lot, I suppose, is that kind of, do you write the whole truth, the absolute truth that you feel is your truth, regardless of what other people are going to feel about it, you know? And I think for me, I felt um, that wasn't right for me to do that. Not that I would, um, you know, this is all true that's in here, but I think some things just didn't feel right, or my story to tell, or my... Um, you know, I didn't feel comfortable delving into certain areas that I was like, actually, that's not, you know? Mm, mm. So um, I, I think I n navigated that constantly, yeah, what to include and what to leave out because it was my family's story as well. And, yeah, I definitely think I left things out, but not um, things that I feel needed to be in the story. Yeah. 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 Right. So... <laughs> You've both written books about the role of place in our lives and our connection with nature. Um, but more than that, I think they're books about the importance of family and connectedness. And um, so I just want to finish before we open up for some questions by asking you each um, how you hope your book might encourage others to change the way they live their lives. Do, do you, is, there, is there any, you know, what, in writing the book... What did you want to? Ha what sort of ripple effect would you like to see in sharing your story, or is it? Yeah. yeah, I see a lot of people who contact me and they said, "I want to make a big change in life, you know, a really big change. Also, give up everything and, and live a life of travelling, or maybe also in the wilderness." Or, and uh, I encourage them because um, we might we have friends now who are actually dying of cancer, and they're quite young; they're in their fifties. And um, they, th they say, oops, I actually had planned after 65 I was going to do something interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, that's too late, isn't it? So um, I think it's really important if you want to do something in life, then start planning tomorrow and start preparing and uh, trying to get out. So I've written a song years ago called Freedom is for Free. You don't need to be a millionaire to, um, to make a radical change of life. If you reduce cost and, you know, be careful with your money, because you do need some savings to live a radical, radically different life, um, then you can do something totally different. But, of course, you have to give up security for that. And the known, all, all what you know, you have to leave behind. Um, but I think it's worth it, because if you're dying, you don't want to have regrets. Because, you know, this is, if you see that you only live once, well, I think you have to make the most of it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Tessie, how, you know, in, ter in terms of sharing your story, I mean, you've talked a little bit, we've talked about the men yeah. awareness around communicating around mental health and that sort of thing. Is that, sure. Was that one, one of the yeah. key drivers? For I think, you? Um, you know, in the book, there's um, sort of different experiences of grief, you know, and um, that was in some cases really dramatic, like um, dad crawling through the CTV building and experiencing this very dramatic thing and then in, in another sense it was just losing this precious object or, you know, losing a house which is not that big a deal in the grand scheme of things but f it feels really like a... feels really close at the time and I think um, after the earthquake we all felt a little bit like, you know, you don't sure how much you can grieve or how much your sadness is warranted, if you know what I mean, because it's in the scheme... it's hard to place it in the scheme of things. Um, and I think... so maybe my book was just a little, just a little bit about... Um, just permission for people to feel however they felt, you know? And um, I think, um, yeah, just hopefully just a, just a personal story that people can kind of find a little bit and that they're like, I, you know, that kind of made me feel like mine was valid too. I don't know. Um, so sort of, yeah, I guess that's where I was at with it. Mm. <laughs> well, I admire the way you and your family are able to communicate with each other about the really big stuff, I think. It's, a, yeah... 
Lots of other families could learn from you. Okay, let's um, open up for some questions now, shall we? Um, Hella is going to be bringing you around the radio mic. And please wait till the mic reaches you and talk right into it like you're licking an ice cream because we are recording this session for a podcast and we'd love to hear your questions um, in, in that. So, so, questions, please. Oh, right up the back. Yeah, thank you. Eating possum as you cook possum for hours and hours, and then you throw it away and drink the water. So, what was eating possum like? <laughs> oh, uh, possum is really nice. And um, the thing is, you have to boil it for a long time, um, an hour or so on the fire. So, not good doing it on your little gas. All the wild meat needs a lot of cooking. So, uh, fire is really good. Um, we boil it until the meat falls off the bone, and then have it with rice. It's really nice. It's white meat, and the oil of it is really easy to clean. It's not like the fatty, it's almost an oil. And I guess it's very healthy for you. And there's plenty of them out there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Oh, there's one at the front to you. Come to you next. music from later on, right, the more recent times in your life? Oh, um, yeah, I think, I think always just music's just a good one for really connecting to a memory, you know, I think I've always found that, and it was, um, initially there was a lot more music stuff in there, which my um, editor was like, let's, let's tone back, um, but uh, I think, yeah, now, um, I actually had the horrible task uh, recently of, after the Occam's Awards, um, at sort of 10 p.m. at night, I had like a tap being like, you know, just so you know, we're going to get up in the morning to do an interview with Jesse Mulligan and can you bring, you know, your three favourite songs? I was like, what? <laughs> this was like so cruel. Um, so then I spent all night in like a panic. Um, but anyway, but um, I, I picked a song. I, is, this, is this still relevant? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, that one, I think I went, I was in Portland uh, last year for the year, just, um, I had a working visa, and, um, you know, Marlon Williams, the New Zealand singer, and he, um, the first week I was there, he played a gig, and I went along to it by myself, and just had the best time um, listening to Party Boy, <laughs> and so that was my pick for Jesse Mulligan, and that will be my pick now. <laughs> well, of course, I'm just going to jump in really quickly, because the title is a song. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so totally. for those of um, you in the audience who haven't read the book yet, do you want to just tell the, yeah. the significance of the we title? Can, we Can Make a Life. Um, it's a Fly My Pretty song, um, and it's, it's one that we've, like, um, Rufus, who is here, my little brother, um, he's a big fan of the song, um, and we, it's a, quite a simple one. You can sort of sing it back and forth which we tend to do late at night in our <laughs> family parties. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, Rufus's um, 21st, which is kind of a big family occasion, um, my other brothers and I thought we'd better do something for him, and so we um, got up and sort of performed that song <laughs> quite badly, but um, it was really sort of a special moment, and I think it was, uh, yeah, just a bit of a perfect fit for this book, really. Yeah. yeah. Well, when I finished reading it, I went and found the song on Spotify and played it, Blasting in my lounge room. Yeah, I just, yeah, you, gotta play that's it loud. Where I and, arrive. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. Good. It was a question here in the white jumper. Yep. Hi, Miriam. I have a couple of questions for you. Um, you mentioned it was a bit of a trauma that first uh, killing the animal, and I was curious how long it took you. So that was just commonplace, and it was easy to do. And the second question is about your relationship, how that time with Peter, right, that time you spent together changed your relationship, and what is the state of your relationship now? <laughs> uh, great questions. 
Killing an animal is never easy. And still, when I shoot a hare, because I started with bow and arrow, but now I have a rifle. It's much more humane, I find. Uh, when I kill a hare and then come to the place, my heart is still beating like mad. Um, I'm always afraid that the animal is actually wounded. or It's never easy. But um, since it is a necessity out in the wilderness, it makes it um, doable. Um, it took about a few times, I guess, for me to get over the trauma. The second time, I didn't cry anymore. <laughs> uh, also because we were, for the first time, warm. It was such a reward. Uh, secondly, with the relationship, I guess we developed a certain alertness uh, because for hunting, all your senses become strong. Time out. <laughs> oh, you're back. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the general alertness increases. And then I found out this is very handy for relationships. And I find that if Peter is angry about something, if I'm really honest, I have ignored five times um, his signals, his, um, the things he said, or his expression in his face. And so who is, um, whose fault is it that we have this conflict in the end? So if you're alert, you can see all the signals coming, working towards conflicts, right? Um, those sort of little things have been really helpful in relationship. But we are 24-7 together, so we know each other really well. Um, yeah, it's going really, it's going good. But also, I don't want to make any conflicts, any argument, because I have no one to turn to. I have to do that. I don't want to, you know, destroy my own day. Um, so I sort of keep it a little bit friendly. <laughs> and another thing, a lot of people recognize this. Um, when he says something totally ridiculous, it's just a joke, right? I laugh about it. But when he says something that's a little bit true, I'm suddenly very upset. And then I think, oh, is he not allowed to tell the truth? So um, I try to use all his comments for uh, personal growth. I tried to see that this is my conditioning. Or, and sometimes he said, oh, this is such and such. And maybe this is very Dutch, actually. And that, uh, so a lot of it is cultural conditioning. And this is great to talk about, because everyone is, you know, I'm never alone in these things, you know. Yeah. Mm. Have you ever thought about taking other couples into the wilderness and doing couples counselling? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we might have time for one more question. If there has, I've got one. If there's none in the audience, yeah, yeah. I have to ask um, if you did change your mind and want to take couples into the bush for that therapy, you, you wouldn't take rifles as well, would you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no rifles, because they might shoot each other. <laughs> no. I've just got one final question then for both of you, and it sort of came just as a spur of the moment one from talking about the soundtrack to your life. Um, could either of you, have either of you been approached um, with an option for this to be a film? And my parents are literally <laughs> like, <laughs> 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 and, and, if, and if a film producer did come to you and say, I want to make a movie about your, your story, what would you say? I'd find that so ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it would be cool, but I don't know they haven't. Um, <laughs> Rufus would play himself. Um, yeah. Don't know about the rest of us. We'd get really cool people to play us. <laughs> Miriam? Uh, yeah, we've been approached, I was just counting, um, for documentaries. And actually the success of the book in Holland is due because of a um, documentary crew that came to us. A Dutch one, Floortje, not the end of the world. Um, to the end of the world, it's called. It's a series. Um, and that was very handy for me to uh, get a bit of publicity in Holland. Um, then the UK one, exactly the same, but the UK version, Ben Fogel, came to us. And then some other smaller ones. So we've done in total six or seven documentaries in the last couple of years. And Peter is totally sick of it. <laughs> um, and one offer for a film. Yeah, a Dutch one. Okay, and, and have you said, sort of oh, you're negotiating. Yeah. Oh, okay, so stay uh, tuned knows. and watch this space. Oh, Joe, you have a question, please. Hi, um, Miriam, you have the most amazing voice. Would you, you sang for us a little time ago. 
Would you be able to share a song with us if that's not asking too much? To sing the same thing again? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, what a lovely way to end the yeah. session. Thank you, good idea. <laughs> I don't think I need a microphone, though. Yeah. I've done some busking in the past, and I've been really trained to sort of reach as far as possible over the entire parking place. <laughs> Do you want to switch it off? Yeah. yeah. yeah I'll, I'll stand up for it. Uh, so it's a song about um, um, living in the mountains, and it goes like this. <clears throat> <laughs> so that's my girlfriend. <laughs> we walk in the mountains, I hunt in the valleys. We sleep on the ground in a place that we have found. The call of the geese echoes in the trees. I receive the energy straight from the earth. Yes, yeah, straight from the earth. La da 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 da. Thank you. Thank you both very, very much. Um, I think it's, it was a delightful session. I think I could sit here and talk to you both for hours, <laughs> um, but we can. are out of time. Um, please join me again in thanking Chessie and Miriam. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and Chessie and Miriam, and if you're really lucky, maybe Rufus will be at the <laughs> signing table now. Um, so you can grab a copy of their books um, from the Page and Blackmore books, Festival Bookshop over there um, and come and have a chat to them. Thank you all very, very much for coming. Um, the next session is already booked out if you haven't got tickets, unfortunately, but there are still tickets available for this afternoon's Friday poem session, which is going to be fabulous. So consider coming back for that. Thank you all very much for coming. Bye-bye. Thank you. You're listening to the 2019 Nelson Arts Festival, Page and Blackmore, Puka Puka Talks.